thank you ladies it's always good to be in your presence and i am honored to be asked to have been asked to do your keynote address for this gathering and i'm very grateful for this 21st century stuff that allows this to go online and be heard at your convenience. And that's it for now. Hold on. Okay. A uh, little background on this. The 211th General Assembly held in 1999 in Fort Worth. Some of us were there. Uh, I served communion on the last day and I did massage for three days and ended up with very sore hands, but that's another thing. They came up with this, racism is a sin. And it, they, in the church and in the mission fields world, worldwide, all over. Uh, since then, little really had been done to come up with plans to really do something to implement anti-racism in the congregations, in the presbyteries, in the synods, and at church-wide gatherings. Uh, they came up with, recently, because of all the anti-racism that's been going on this past year in particular, uh, the, wow, synods, presbyteries, and the national church have been studying the problem and working on possible solutions. They need to work faster, but that's my opinion. Uh, in May of 2019, I was among 15 people who gathered at Stony Point, the conference center in New York, to work and learn together just how to overcome this spreading problem. Uh, there were 14 woman, women and one lone man. I think he was very brave. Uh, five of the women were white, nine were black. The man, Gun Ho, was Chinese, is Chinese. Uh, we were warned that it could get uncomfortable for us, but we were all warned not to pick on anyone, be careful of what we say, all of us, and think about what we say, always remembering that we are all beloved children of God, and that through him, we know there is but one race, the human race. We agreed to be respectful of people of the, and their points of view. It was okay to disagree, but not okay to blame, uh, shame, or attack. And we also agreed to protect people's privacy and to be very aware of the impact others, and most of all, remember the space of grace. I thought that was an interesting way to look at it. We are to see people who they are, from one person to be free. All of us need freedom. And here is a there are description of racism. It's the term for ongoing efforts of white supremacy. It refers to the systemic and structural ways that our society is still quite centered, quite dominated, and quite identified. It is an ongoing structure of society that gives advantage to whites at the expense of people of other racial groups. Racism is ingrained in almost every aspect of our culture and society. It affects all of us, positively or negatively.
directly or indirectly on a daily basis. This debit, pardon me, definition of racism is structurally and systemic. It does not apply to individuals. It is not concerned with personal feelings or attitudes. There are persons who believe that white people are better than others, who harbor ill feelings towards people of other racial groups, and who perceive others through the lens of, a, of racial stereotypes. These persons are prejudiced and bigoted. Uh, of course, bigotry and prejudice contribute to the systemic, to systemic racism, but the tendency to frame racism in terms of personal attitudes does too. Focusing on the feelings of individual prevents us from recognizing and addressing the economic, legal, and societal structures that benefit white people and disadvantage those and disadvantage others. It can also lead us to quickly to absolve ourselves of responsibility to change these larger structures. In return to, to return to uh, the car analogy, uh, talking about uh, in Louisville, Kentucky, the place was built for the automobile. Uh, their sidewalks are almost non-existent and things like this. And their buses, apparently, they've got worse bus uh, traffic than uh, here and there in Dallas, which is, leads, leaves a lot to be desired, but much better than Louisville. Um, if, one if one person perceives the problem and chooses to walk, bike, or ride the bus, this does not change the reality of Lou Louisville's car-centered structure. Likewise, if one of, or even many people don't harbor racial, racial prejudice or bigotry, this does not change the inherited structures of our society that are white-centered. Oh, and we, uh, biblically, we, rec we consider racism a sin against God and against humanity. It's helpful to recall that Reformed theology includes an account of origin, original sin, a state we find ourselves in, regardless of our own choosing, and actual sin. Ooh, get, gone from preaching to meddling here, I'm sorry. Uh, particular ways of being in the world that make original sin concrete and break relationships with God and neighbors. Uh, racism is the original sin of the United States. It's not no one alive today created the system of white supremacy, although we neither respons we're neither responsible nor guilty of creating this system. We recognize it as a part of our fallen state and as a violator of who we are meant to be together. Trusting in God's grace, we have to confess the brokenness and go on from there. Okay, Presbyterian Women's Purpose commits us to various ministries that help us share God's love with others. Two of these commitments, to work for justice and peace and build an inclusive, caring community of women that strengthens our denomination and witnesses to the promise of God's realm. Uh, this is from the Horizons Magazine. Ladies, if you don't get Horizons Magazine, why not? It has very valuable information. You get your study guide every year. Do it. Uh, we have a lot of folks that are working towards this conversations in faith and uh, this sort of thing. Oh, here's one. Uh, Robert Black, the rector of St. Luke's Episcopal Church, shared his congregation's efforts to, in support of their denomination-wide in, initiative, Becoming the Beloved Community, which focuses on racial healing, reconciliation, and justice. His largely white congregation is developing a relationship 
with an African American congregation, uh, Soldiers Memorial African Methodist Episcopal Zion Church. Whoa, that's a long one. Uh, it must be fun trying to get that on a sign or on uh, church literature. Anyway, okay, I digress, I'm sorry. Uh, members of these two Salisbury congregations are in early stages of building a discussion group that will meet periodically to build personal relationships and discuss, and I hope, listen. We need to listen. Uh, dis uh, issues. He shared that St. Luke's received a mission grant from the Diocese of North Carolina to support their radical, their racial reconciliation work in Salisbury. Uh, in addition to enabling St. Luke to make a documentary series uh, that captures stories from individuals who lived in Salisbury during the Jim Crow area, era, pardon me, uh, the grant will also help parishes understand the impact of racism and slavery uh, on St. Luke and how the now closed historical, historically uh, African American congregation St. Philip's, uh, beyond the grant and discussion group, St. Luke has also hosted community wide dinner and discussion events. I imagine that's been put on hold, although the weather around here is getting nice enough, we could do it in church parking lots. Um, at the time of our fall gathering, they had just met uh, to discuss and uh, uh, Melody Hobson's t TED Talk, Colorblind or Color Brave. That's something really worth thinking about. Uh, in which Melody talks about the value of reconciliation, reconciling race and diversity rather than minimizing or ignoring it. Um, Subsequent discussions have examined, are examined for uh, examining the for-profit prisons which incarcerate African Americans at deplorably high rates and other individuals' reflections on race. Ah. Now, here's another from our Regardless of race, from the moment we wake, we take our first breath on American soil, our existence rotates around whiteness. In this country, whiteness is a standard, the default. From the faces celebrated as beautiful to people serving as leaders, from style of dress to patterns of speech, whiteness shapes us as a community and as individuals. I know this may be uncomfortable for a lot of us, but we need to face it, folks. People of color sub subconsciously learn that whiteness is superior, preferable, in the ultimate prize to achieve happiness, admiration, love, acceptance, visibility, and attain full value of society. Assimilation to whiteness is a necessity. Yet, the culture and customs of people of color are absorbed, repackaged, then labeled Euro-unique, Euro which makes them more palatable for white people. This silences cultures outside the center. We, when the North, uh, the Europeans, most of them were from uh, North and West Europe started immigrating, although they didn't realize they were immigrating at that time, coming to the they, they, uh, trappers came. They ran into problems with the natives. They tried to extinguish the neighbors, the, the uh, natives. As more of them came in, more stringent laws or ideas were put in place. They don't look like us. They don't talk like us. Uh, they don't till the land. And most of these trappers came 
as former field workers. Because you realize in Europe at that time, peasants, which they would probably, what they probably were, were almost like slaves. One person owned a large estate and the people that lived around it worked for him. And if he didn't feel like paying them, or if he wanted more than they felt he was worth having, things could get very sticky. So they went to North America. They came to North America. Oh boy. They encountered the natives that were are very spiritual, but they didn't do it the same way they did, and most of them would have been Roman. Our the forefathers were predominant. The trappers were predominantly Roman Catholic, and uh, so you didn't cross yourself. Uh, you didn't worship the way we they did, and uh, the uh, natives had their own spiritual ways of doing things, and it it just went from bad to worse. And it took a long time for our native sisters and brothers to be granted citizenship. And a lot of us didn't don't realize that until we start studying. Anyway, okay, let's get back to this. Uh, regardless of race, uh, that we are, uh, okay, People who are white benefit from the structure, the way things are going around here, from birth, uh, so are less compelled to consider whiteness. Social justice trainer and author Robin DiAngelo writes, like most white people raised in the US, I was not taught to see myself in racial terms and certainly not to draw attention to my race or to behave as if it mattered in any way. It was like the tale of asking a fish what it was like to live in water, and the fish replies, what's water? Surprising what we take for granted. Our entire lives centers around the whiteness, and yet simultaneously, whiteness remains invisible to so many. And your shade of whiteness can make a lot of difference in a lot of cultures. I discovered from uh, a former nail tech I had, who was uh, from Vietnam, that uh, I thought she had lovely colored skin, very light tan, and uh, she was discriminated against in Vietnam because she was considered dark, uh, too dark. And I said, what do you mean? She said, yeah, we, to, to get anywhere, you had to be lighter skin. And it's like that in a lot of other places too, the lighter the skin. And uh, of course, the only thing that saves me, I guess, is all the freckles. Mind you, we got together and I'd have a great tan. But, uh, and I, I'm not, I've never been happy with having freckles, but it's okay. Anyway, I guess I'm too old. Okay. <clears throat> uh, recently, uh, 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 theology class in at Louisville uh, Seminary, they deviated from their course topic to rejoice uh, about the 10th birthday of the son of one of our students. The class began, began discussing what a treat it was for a child to become a preteen, oh, well, I'm glad some people think so, uh, because the door of independence begins to open a little wider. After all, they're growing up and getting closer to adulthood. Uh, my students talk joyfully about what they thought, uh, what they taught to their preteen children. Even though the conversation continued to be updated and filled with laughter, my body began to fill with anxiety. I began to think about my situationness. 
Where I come from, particularly as a woman of color, and is different from that of that what society consi considers the norm. Sorry about that, folks. No, not today. Please, not today, not again, I thought to myself. Then one of my students asked, asked me if I had a child, and more specifically, if I had a son. If so, what I taught him when he was a preteen. Being the only black woman in much of my day-to-day -day professional life makes it challenging to fully participate in discussion. My words often introduce a different perspective, a non-centered perspective. It doesn't seem to matter whether my thoughts are viewed as correct or incorrect. They're not white. So I bite my lip and smile and in, if, in an effort not to stray too far from my safe space. And I think we've all been in situations like that. Uh, Robin D'Angelo notes that white people who rarely have to consider their race find such conversations and non-centered views difficult. Uh, all of this, my interest in <clears throat> racism began as a child up in Canada when I saw the way the natives up there were treated. Uh, the city of Edmonton, where I grew up, is surrounded by Indian reservations. And on the weekends, uh, a lot of the natives came into town. And they were constantly harassed and harangued and things like this. And then as I got a little older, studied Canadian history, I found out to my horror that the Royal Northwest Mounted Police, otherwise known as the Mounties, you know the guys with the red scarlet coats and the mm -hmm. Boy Scout type hats and the rode horses and things like this, they were started to quell the Real Rebellion in the mid 1860s. Real was a what we call up in Canada a Métis. You call them half-breeds. Uh, he was tired of the way he and his sisters and brothers were being treated and started to rebel in Saskatchewan before it became a province. And so this mounted police force was started, was begun to kill as many of these protesters as possible. And it changed the way I look at the RCMP. Then I read something very recently uh, in a, one of those historical things on uh, um, YouTube or something like this, that the FBI was started to put down rebellions by our colored sisters and brothers, our native sisters and brothers. And uh, they, uh, but it didn't last long and the government took them over and now we have what we have. <clears throat> uh, I like this, <clears throat> this that, I'm sorry I got off on a tangent, but uh, now you know where I come from. Uh, the smallest amount of racial stress is intolerable. I sometimes have to sit down and try to put myself in the place of, as we call them in Canada, First Peoples or as a uh, native uh, of the United States. Because folks, Canadians are Americans too, because we share the North American continent with you. Anyway, uh, the, it's, it's really sad. Anyway, here's something. 
People of color still tend to believe that if they look like someone else, there is more of a chance they will be accepted and not get hurt. Uh, that's kind of scary, and you see these uh, stories all the time about a woman of color warning her sons especially to be very diligent when they leave the house. Be very respectful. Don't draw attention to yourself. Uh, it's almost like you got that hoodie, put it up, up around your face and for, don't deviate from that path to the school. Don't give your teachers a hard time. Don't pick on anybody. If you're stopped by the police, be very polite. This sort of thing. And it's not, we didn't, us uh, white women, we don't have to tell, we tell our sons and daughters, policemen are your friends. Uh, my mother used to t send us off to school with pen, pencil, nose wipe. Don't forget, policemen are your friends. This was drilled into me as a very young child. And I must say, I did it to my children. Remind them, if you get lost, try to find a policeman. Of course, I came from a place where policemen walked a beat. And uh, you could usually find one not too far away from where you might be. And you could ask them uh, where I need to, did I t make the right turn or, hey, I'm hopelessly lost, I need to get to. Anyway, uh, they don't have that, they don't feel they have that option. Even if the, the policeman they run into is the same color as them. This is one of the things that has really brought to the forefront the issue of racism and our need to get rid of it once and for all. Uh, there was something else. Uh, and this uh, pamphlet put out by the uh, Racial Equality and Win Women's Intercultural Ministries uh, has many references to scripture. And uh, especially in Jesus, uh, sorry about that, there was a thing and it sort of caught me. Uh, there was uh, many times Jesus in his actions and his speak is talking. got out of the box. He talked to women. He talked to a tax collector, Zacchaeus. He talked to people he shouldn't have, made his disciples a little nervous on occasion, but this is God's way of telling us to include those we wouldn't normally include. And, um, Here's this, I want to share this with you. Some of these, uh, they avoid words that exclude. I've never thought about it, that words that exclude. I know that uh, back in the 90s, uh, we tried to make inclusive language popular in, through our hymn books. And we still have people that, uh, you know, it, to me it's God rest you gentle, merry gentlemen. I'm old, but uh, that's why I stick with that sort of thing. Whereas some people just aren't going to do it. But think about the people that, uh, whose fathers, earthly fathers, were the, either absent or made their lives absolutely miserable. Whereas their mothers 
or grandmothers in a lot of instances were the comforter, kind of like the Holy Spirit, the comforter, and that's something we all need. So why not look at God as a mother? He's in the, you look in, the, in scripture, and uh, it, he's, you know, the mother hen gathering her brood, uh, things like that. We all remember those. Uh, how much time do we have left? Well, we're still going to thirty minutes. Oh boy! <laughs> Sorry about that. Oh, here I'll share this with you. I kind of uh, referred to a little of it, but when we uh, we we did this, uh, our vision statement at this training I went to in Stony Point, we came up with this vision statement. The PC USA covenants to embrace racial and cultural diversity as God-given assets to the human family. Uh, we love, most, most people around here love Mexican food. Soul food's real good too. We like Italian food. We like Chinese food. People make that. They're sharing their culture with us. Uh, here in Texas, we're big beef eaters, although we have more sheep on foot on the ground than we do cattle anymore. And uh, down around San Angelo, there that's the wool capital of the United States. There's a lot of and I know because I have relatives uh, that are sheep, uh, grow sheep, as, and then uh, a lot of horses. Anyway, we use and we enjoy their, when they have, uh, when there are cultural events, we enjoy them. Why can't we go from there telling ourselves and meaning it? They're, we're going to find out more about these people. We need to embrace them. They're our, they too are beloved children of God. They are our adopted sisters and brothers. Just as God adopted us to be sisters and brothers with Christ, he adopted them. Everybody from the North Pole to the South Pole and everywhere in between, we are all children of God. And we're supposed to love our neighbors as ourselves. I think from that, the way I've been looking at that lately, we love our neighbors as God and Jesus love us. Because some, let's face it, some days we don't even like ourselves when we've really done something stupid and we weren't teenagers when we did it but um, hopefully we can um, get over that look at it find the source of it and get it out of our lives um, the uh, all everybody has assets some people are really good with fix figures. Yesterday I was doing my laundry and I told God I was very grateful to the people he had chosen or given the knowledge to, to come up with automatic washers and dryers. Because I wasn't out there on a scrub board or hanging it in the yard, mainly because I got too many birds that would end up messing it up, so I just have to bring it back. And you guys get the idea. Uh, we're all that way, but uh, we have air-conditioned homes. God's got his finger in that. We've got air-conditioned cars. We have so many modern conveniences. We've got glasses, which really helps so many of us. And because uh, without mine, let me 
I tell you, folks, I don't see that, especially close up. Uh, forget it. And I didn't need reading glasses until after I had cataract surgery. Anyway, um, here's a good one. Share the load equitably of emotional labor. We've, had, we've been in the company of people that are so emotionally upset because of something that has happened. Uh, a, a child uh, developed cancer. Uh, the, their whole home situation has changed. And this COVID thing is really adding to that. There is so much stress in all areas of this country. We need to let people know it when they come to us and start talking to us. We listen with our ears, not with our mouths. I know we, we may have been in a similar situation, but we need to hear what they have to say. We need to hear what our colored sisters and brothers have been through. We need to hear what some of their ancestors have gone through. And our uh, native, our first peoples. I was talking to a friend that is uh, also a uh, native person and it, I found out something really interesting. Do you know that uh, if our First Peoples have a, has chose a Hispanic last name. They didn't get forced to a reservation. So that's why you got a lot of natives uh, in this part of the world that do not, that have Hispanic last names. They were chosen, they, their ancestors chose them so they didn't have to go on a reservation. They could pretty much stay where they were. So that's why, and that's why in some places you have very small enclaves of native first people. Um, we're to lament mindfully. That's one of those that, um, that it says be self-aware is what I next to it. That's one of those things that I'm still trying to figure out how to do that. Uh, I guess, do you suppose it has to do with, we think about it, really think of why we're lamenting? And if we're lamenting with someone because of something that's in their lives, Are we aware of what it's doing to our lives? Or it could? Anyway, that's something we have to uh, think about. Um, be respectful of a person's point of view, always, no matter who it is even if it's a 13-year-old granddaughter who, well, we won't go into that. She's 13, what else can I say? It's okay to disagree, not okay to blame, shame, or attack. That's the way it should be in any group. I don't care if you're green. You, it, like I said, you disagree, but you don't blame or attack. We're to protect people's privacy. Avoid side conversation. It, dis, it disturbs others, especially if you're in a group working on a good answer for that group to 
the anti-racism flag and run with. We have to be present. No interruptions. That's hard, especially me. Uh, it's okay with discomfort. And as a white person, oh boy, when I was at this training, it was, it got very uncomfortable on occasion for us five white women. Uh, and the, our, uh, our, our friend Gun Ho, uh, he got kind of a little squirmy too, but um, he had been through some uh, pretty uh, nasty uh, racism things in his search for an education and trying to immigrate, uh, that sort of thing. We need to be aware of the impact of what we say and what we do is to others. Think about it. It'll probably help us if we think before we speak and listen, like I say, and don't forget, there's always space for grace. I like that. And don't, uh, I like this. Uh, I wrote down, read feedback, and then I wrote, oops, ouch, educate. You say something without thinking about it, it just sort of pops out of your mouth on occasion. We, we've all done it. And, or you, you thought about what you were going to say, and it didn't quite come out the way you wanted it. It's okay to say, oops. I'm sorry, I can't take that back, but I would like to let you hear what I meant to say. Uh, we need to share the load equitably of the emotional labor. Don't let just one person shoulder all of the emotional load. Because there is going to be things that cause a lot of emotions when we're talking in groups or one-on-one. Uh, -on -one. And we need to share that. Let somebody know that uh, we really care. We really want this to be, this racism thing to be over and done with forever. Oh, boy, can I dream. Uh, what are we going, how are we going to impact communities? Uh, uh, we amplify not I'm sorry, I can't read that. I can't read my own writing. We've all done that. Um, the, uh, okay. Here's this thing. Ooh. Uh, the definition of racism is structural and systemic. Yeah, okay. The, also, the definition precludes so-called reverse racism or racism among different racial groups. When blacks harbor prejudice against white or Latinos, Latinas, Latinos, are bigoted towards Asian Americans, this can't be accu accurately called racism, racism because it's not structural. Uh, there is no structure in the United States that gives power and advantage to blacks over white or Latinas, Latinos over Asian Americans. Uh, finally, it's important to recognize racism as one of the number of structural hierarchies of power. 
Sexism refers to the ways in which our culture is male-centered, centered, pardon me, male-dominated and male-identified. Um, historically, the economic and educational, legal and social structures of the United States have been built for men. The ongoing efforts of these structures grant power and advantage to men over women and transgender people. These various structures of racism, sexism, classism, and so forth connect and overlap. Uh, the term intersectionality is used to describe this. For example, a black, black woman occupies the space where racism and sexism intersect. The way racism disadvantages her will be influenced by the structures of sexism and vice versa. Uh, women have made great strides uh, since they were granted the vote here in 1920. Was it 21? 20. 20. Okay, because in Canada they got in in 1919. My mother was a whole four years old. Uh, that's neither here nor there, and she voted in every election. And uh, some of them aren't. Our elections were not four years apart. I remember one prime minister got booted out after nine months. And the only election year for six weeks, folks. I think we, our people need to look into that too. Um, we need to, biblically we consider racism as a sin against God and humanity. We have to really stop and think as to where we've been and where we're headed. Do we, as followers of Christ, really want to make a difference in this world? We can start in our own little corners and take it on out. This, uh, the information and the materials I have, I'll be glad to share with any of you if you want to start, a, say, a discussion group in your church, in your neighborhood. But you have to be willing to listen and you have to be willing to take some heat. All of us no matter what color we are. Even those of us that got polka dots. Uh, that's all I've got for now. Thanks, appreciate it folks.